This video is going to be about the concept of an inverse. All right, specifically, we're going to talk about the inverse of a function. All right, so here's our basic um, definition. An inverse function undoes another function. Right? That's, that's what a, an inverse is. Right? It's the function that undoes the original function. All right, now, before I give you an example of that, let me um, kind of show you a little bit of the notation that you need to be, fami be familiar with. So if we have a function f, the inverse of f, this is the way we write that. Okay, and let me be clear. This, we don't say f to the negative first power. That's not the way we say that. Right? We call this f. This is the inverse of f. Right? Similarly, if I had g as a function, well, the inverse of g, we would write it like this. Okay, g and the inverse of g, or g inverse. Okay. Let's say we're talking about the output of a function. So if I had f of x, right, that would be the output of f. How would we denote that the inverse of that? Right? That would be like this. Right? So this is f of x. This is f inverse of x. Right? Don't say something like f minus 1x. Right? This is f of x. This is f inverse of x. This is g, g inverse, or the inverse of g. This is f, f inverse, or the inverse of f. Okay. Okay. So now that we kind of have our notation down, let's let's kind of give an example of, of what we mean by a function in undoing another function. All right. So imagine I have a function f, right? And I'm going to use this um, this magic box analogy again, right? So imagine I input three into the function, and it outputs five, right? And let's say if I input 7, it outputs 9, okay? just as an example. All right, so w what would the inverse do? Right? The inverse just does the opposite, basically. It undoes what was, was already done by the function. Right? So if our original function, if you input 3 and you get an output of 5, what would the inverse do? Well, if you inputted 5 into the inverse, it would take you back to 3. Right? And same thing here. If you input 7 into the original function and it outputs 9, well, the inverse just does, just does this backwards. In other words, if I input 9 into f inverse, you'll get an output of 7. Okay, let's use function notation to kind of summarize this. Right? So this first um, picture here, this is showing that f of 3 is equal to 5. Right? And, or in other words, um, the output when your input's 3 is 5. Right? And so what do we know about our inverse? Well, we know that that would tell us that f inverse of, of 5 would get me 3. Right? Or in other words, the output when my in, input's 5 is going to be 3. Okay? So you, go ahead and pause real quick. This is not going to take you long. But can you write down uh, these last two? in function notation, right? What would it mean for if we input 7, get output of 9 for f, and if we input 9, we get an output of 7 for the inverse of f? Okay, pause and write that. All right, that shouldn't have taken you that long. Here's what we sh you should have, right? So this means f of 7 is equal to 9, right? Or when you input 7, you get an output of 9. For the inverse, it's just backwards, right? f inverse of 9 would get you 7. Or in other words, the output when you input 9 into the inverse function is going to be 7. Alright, let's do this example. Some input and output values of a function are shown below. Right? And we're going to call this function g of x. What do we know about the function's inverse? Okay. So this is our inputs, these are our outputs for our function. Right? And the question now is, what does this tell me about the inverse? Right? In other words, if I were to make it a t-chart for g inverse, oops, that doesn't look very good. Let me try that again. If I were to make an input-output table for the inverse of g, right, what would it be? I want you to pause and try to think. What would it be? All right. Let's see if you got it right. So here's what would happen. 
if we input these values into g and get these outputs, well, the inverse function would just do it backwards. It, it would undo it. Right? So in other words, if we were to input 8 into our inverse, what would we get out? We would get an output of negative 3. If we were to input 4 into our inverse, we would get an output of 5. If we input negative 1 into our inverse, we would get an output of 7. If we were to input negative 6 into our inverse function, we would get an output of 10. Right? So it, it's just basically doing it backwards. Right? Um, and I'm not going to do this for all of them, but we can also write this in function notation. Right? I just want to do this at least once to emphasize this. Right? So what does this first ordered pair mean? Negative 3, 8. That means that g of negative 3 is equal to 8. Right? Or in other words, when you input negative 3, you get an output of 8. Or you could say it, the output for an input of negative 3 is 8. What does that mean for the inverse? Right? It just means the same thing backwards. Right? In other words, g inverse of 8 would get me to negative 3. Right? When we input negative 8, I'm sorry, positive 8 into our inverse, we get negative 3. All right. We, we're going to take the same idea and apply it to a graph. All right, here's the graph of h of x. And we want to find these values, h inverse of 1. Joy All right. Um, now, nah, don't you hate that when Barroso the loudspeaker the goes off? Office. Right. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. All right, so again, we want to find h inverse of 1. Okay, now this is a little bit different because we don't have the graph of h inverse. We have the graph of h of x. All right, and let's, let's kind of think again about our, our table of values. Right. So, what 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 do we what do we kind of do in our last video or last slide? All right. We were basically saying, and let me just use um, symbols here. If I were to input a into my original function and get, let's just say b, what well, what would that mean for the inverse? Well, that would mean that if you input b into the inverse, you would get a for the output for the inverse. Right? It's just backwards. Okay? So let's think about this. We want to figure out what h inverse of 1 is equal to. Right? In other words, we're trying to figure out if I input 1 into my inverse, what would the output be? Right? Well, let's think about that. I, I don't know this yet, but l let's think about what that would mean for our original function. Right? If we're inputting... Uh, a 1 into the inverse, that means that 1 would be in the output spot for the original function. Right? And so let's think about that. In this graph, where do we have an output value of 1? Right? Outputs are our y values. Right? So here's 0, here's 1. Where do we have an output value of 1? Hey, right here. This is the point uh, 3 comma 1. Right? Let's put that in our input output table. So, in other words, the output is going to be 1 when the input is 3. Okay, so what does that mean for the inverse? Well, the inverse would be when you input 1, you get an output of 3. So, h inverse of 1 is equal to 3. All right, I'd like you to pause and do the next two. All right, thank you for pausing. If you didn't pause, shame on you. Let's, let's show the answer. Okay, so we want to figure out h inverse of negative 2. Okay, so in other words, what happens when we input negative 2 into our inverse function? Well, if we're inputting negative 2 into the inverse function, that means negative 2 must be an output value for our original function. And we can ask the question, where do we get an output value of negative 2? All right, we get an output value of negative 2. Um, here's 0, 1, or negative 1, negative 2. We get an output of negative 2 when the input is negative 1. So that must mean, for the inverse, when we input negative 2, we get negative 1. So h inverse of negative 2 is negative 1. Okay, last one, h inverse of 0. Right? So we're asking, what happens when we input 0 into our inverse? If we input 0 into the inverse, that must mean 0 is the output for the original function.
right? And let's see, where do we have an output of zero, right? Three, two, one, zero, right here. This point here is two comma zero. That has an output of zero. So that has this endpoint, two, zero. So that must mean for the inverse, when we input zero, we get an output of two. So h inverse of zero must be two. Okay, last one, last example here. The definitions of m of x and n of x are shown below. One of those two functions is the inverse for p of x. We know that p of 4 is equal to 14. Is m of x or n of x the inverse of p of x? All right, here's this is a kind of complicated problem here. Actually, not that bad, but let's first make sure you understand what we're asking. Right? We've got two functions here, m of x and n of x. One of those two functions is the inverse of p of x. In other words, p inverse could either be equal to m of x or p inverse could be equal to n of x. Right? We don't know which one. We don't know if this is true. We don't know if this is true. One of those has to be true. Okay? Um, what do we know? What else do we know? Well, we do know that p of 4 equals 14. Right? Well, let's think about that. What does that tell us about the inverse of p? Well, if p of 4 is equal to 14, that must mean that p inverse of 14 would have to be equal to 4. Right? Because inverse just, does, just undoes what the function does. Right? So we can use that, this is the most important thing here, we can use this fact to try to figure out which one, m or n, is actually the inverse. Right? So in other words, when we input 14 into the, inver into the inverse function, we should get an output of 4. Right? And that's because when you input 4 into the original function, you get an output of 14. Right? So the inverse must be backwards. Input 14, you get an output of 4. So basically, we have to figure out which one of these, m or n, will get you an output of 4 when you input 14. Right? And I'd like you to do that. I'd like you to see what happens when you input 14 into m, and what happens when you input 14 into n. Go ahead and do that, please. Pause and do that. All right, let's see how you did. When I input 14 into m, we would get this, 1 half times 14 minus 6. All right, so m of 14, half of, would get this, half of 14 is 7, 7 minus 6 is 1. So m of 14 is equal to 1. Well, that's not right, because we, we would want, well, I mean, it is right, but that means m can't be the inverse. Because for the inverse to be, for this to be the inverse, we, when we input 14, we would have to get an output of 4. Okay, let's see if it works for n. Right, so let's see what n of 14 is. Right, that would be 1 half times 14 minus 3. So n of 14 would be 7 minus 3, which is 4. Bailey right. Ramirez to the so, office. Bailey I'll wait again for the loudspeaker. Office. Sorry. All right, so again, what does that tell us? n of 14 is equal to 4. And up here we said that the inverse of p, when you, when you, when you input 14 into the inverse of p, you should get 4. So that means that n of x is p inverse of x, right? Because we showed that when you input 14 into n, you get 4. And that's what was supposed to happen for the inverse. So n of x is p inverse.